Hey everyone, welcome back to the Brass and Unity podcast. I'm Kelsey Sharon, your host, and today I have a Yankee with me. I have a full-blown, American-blooded Yankee, and his name is Jake Phillips, and he is part of our community in the veteran world, as well as he is also in so many more incredible things, including voice acting, and that is... I have so many questions to even begin having this conversation with you. So please, everyone, welcome Jake Phillips. Hello. Hey. Hey, friend. How's, How's it going? going? Good. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for gracing us with your American flag. Yeah. I know. It's 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 exciting. I see. Oh, yeah, that. that's actually outside the door of my... That wasn't intentional. That was just... I'm just I, patriotic. It just sort of pops up everywhere. You know what I am, it feels so. right. It feels right. Yeah. I, I mean, I do like it. I got flags everywhere. I love that. You, I love I love having conversations with my my brothers and sisters to the South because there is something about Americans that cannot be described unless you visually like see it and actually hear it for the first time. OK, it's a good thing, but you yeah. got to have um, a real strong identity. Yeah, like, I think so. Mo the, well, some some of us do. The southern side does. The southern side does, which is funny when you introduced me as a Yankee uh, on the going back to the American Civil War, a Yankee that oh, was shit. who fought, you know, on the Union side. Uh, now, obviously, I'm speaking in historic terms here. I, I, you know, some people say, well, he must not like black people. If he's from the South. That's ridiculous. That's not true at all. No, not at all. No. And um, people that. When I was in the army, a lot of times when a, a uh, African-American soldier would hear, oh, the new lieutenant, he's from uh, uh, Mississippi. You could just you could see him tighten up. And I was just like, you watch too much TV, man. Just get to know me. We'll be all right. Yeah, well, that, well that's what happens, I find, is uh, it's funny that you brought that up in the way you did, because I've experienced it um, <clears throat> in, in a similar way, um, both ways. So what I mean is my parents are long haul truck drivers. So I used to go with mom and dad in the truck for two, three weeks at a time while they took loads down to Texas and over to Florida and up to California. So I, I don't say I was raised in the truck. I mean, I was in it a, a good amount, but it was part of like my school would let me go kind of thing. My dad wasn't creepy and kidnapped me or anything, but like I would go a lot. And um, it was really fun because I got to see a totally different side of the United States. When you're younger, you watch TV, you see perspectives, but you don't often, they don't match up in real life. And so if you never got the opportunity to travel there, you'll never get to really know what's true and what's not. So your perception is what it is until you actually experience it. So I can, I can appreciate that though. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The South is, the South is um, an interesting place for a Canadian to go when you have never been anywhere else in the United States. Yeah, I could see that. <clears throat> have you been to Canada? One, I've been to Canada one time. I flew into Gander, Newfoundland and just hung out there for just a little bit. I was on my way to Iraq. So it was gorgeous, but I didn't get to hang out, unfortunately. So that is so far, barely on the map of Canada. <laughs> It's like they are their own. They are such a cool type of people out there that are so different than the rest of Canada. Like they are so Irish and in their ways, and Good. yeah, they they're fantastic human beings. Like they're the like the nicest of all of us. And so, interesting. Didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're super, super nice. And then it kind of it gets they stay really nice until you get about Quebec, and then you kind of get this weird. They want to separate, but they only ever get about 48% of the votes to separate from Canada. So it's like, it's kind of like that, um, like that, that kid, you know, you're like, oh, I, he has to be in my class. He like, there's no way we can get rid of him, but he really doesn't want to be there. And he makes it known to everybody that he hates being in that class. And so <clears throat> you get this kind of view that you're like, okay, we know you don't want to be here. We just stay in your, and that's where I was posted. So it gets kind of cranky. And then Ontario gets a little, well, there's Toronto. You get that little, you know, higher fashion, New york -y kind of feel. A lot of music. So, so why is Quebec like that? Is it because of all the French people or what is yeah. it? Yeah. No, it's all the French people. Like, it's okay, okay. definitely the French people. Okay, okay. There's a, um, 
have you ever worked with the French military? Like the Canadian French military? Um, no, 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 not Canadian French. Mm -mm. You worked with France? I've worked with ex French. I've worked with guys um, from the uh, Foreign Legion, but they weren't really French. You know what I mean? No, that's a different. Yeah, that's that's yeah. But, you know, Quebec, uh, Quebec French is interesting because if you were to ask somebody from France about Quebec French, they would say it's not real French. OK, it's it's got a lot of slang to it. So like if I were to say like like je m'appelle like je m'appelle Kelsey. Come on, ça va? It's very like that's like, hi, I'm Kelsey. How are you? But that's like but then if you were to say in Quebec, it's like um, say Kelsey, ça va? Like, what's like, up? What's going on? It's interesting. You go over, if you speak uh, Quebec French, you go over to France. They'll just like, they won't, they won't acknowledge your existence. <laughs> <laughs> like they can understand you fine. They just think they're better than you. No, sometimes the French is so, so different. Like, so for example, Quebec is right beside New Brunswick. And there is a massive uh, artillery base out there where I was posted. And um, in New Brunswick, they also have French people. But it's different French. It's Acadian French. So it is very, uh, like, rugged. Like, very, very, like, very rough French. Like, uh, kind of picture. Um, what's a good example, Josh? Do you know Acadian French? Like, like New Brunswick. Ooh, I don't know if I've ever heard no okay i'm trying to think but anyway I can, i'll give you the best example i'm not a voice actor and i feel like i can't even believe i'm doing this in front of somebody who can actually do like voice impressions and shit and i'm like kels rein it in um so he's i had a, a bombardier chef so master bombardier and um he was my staff and he was about 250 6 to just big guy like this but he talked like this the mother of his city sounded muffled like this and so he'd be like and I'm like, I can't fucking understand you. Can you open your mouth? And he just would yell at me incessantly. And I, I never understood him. Sweetest, like human teddy bear. Greatest guy. But just so like, just rough. And I can't even, ugh, I'll stop. It was bad. It was bad. Well, if you couldn't understand him, I mean, shoot. Didn't well, really matter what he says. Well, exactly. And so that was it, right? It's like, you can yell at me until you're blue in the face. Eventually, you're going to have to say something I, I understand. Yeah. yeah. It's fair yeah. enough. Okay, I need to, I have, can I ask it 962 questions now? Go ahead. Okay. First off, I'm, apologies for booking you on election day. You must be third. Oh, I, I, uh, I voted this morning. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm good. How does that work in the States? Are you got, do you guys talk about who you vote for? <clears throat> I mean, some people do, some people don't. I usually don't. I've found that that people uh, they'll make assumptions about you and your character based on what an inaccurate or inaccurate view of the the guy or gal they're voting for. Fair enough. And, and I feel like that um, friendships that I have are more valuable than my political views. So I usually just don't even talk about it. I think that's why I like I like you and your family so much. It's because I. There's something about the way you guys on and, and and not to like talk about your family, but like we, you know, we talk to your brother. We, we know Tim and all them. You guys are all like he's not actual blood, but he feels like he might as well be one of your brothers. Um, <laughs> and uh, like your wife and I just I'm I, I'm obsessed with the way that you guys are as a, as a family and as a unit and just how you're so all integrated. But it just is nothing but you, the way you guys portray your love. <clears throat> get it together the way you know, I, up. I, yeah, well, I just you guys are so sweet I can't help it um no you guys just the way you portray your life and the way you uh you just seem to radiate only a positive message and you never you never say or even if you have an opinion it's always like nothing but a constructive way it's put out into the public and I think that's shows your um that shows your character on its own no matter who you vote for i think that shows you're the type of person who cares more like you said about relationships over politics because at the end of the day the, that's what's left over is the family <clears throat> exactly and i've i know people that 
I love them. I love their friendship and they might be voting for someone else than I am. Yeah. But when that president is gone or the governor is gone, I still would like that friendship because we're still going to be in the same area, most likely long after the president's changed out. Yeah, exactly. That's the goal. You want to, you want long, I don't need four year relationships and then we'll revamp and we'll discuss. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's <laughs> only for politicians. We don't need that with our friendships. No, exactly. So I will say I had, um, in Canada, we don't, uh, well, I'm speaking for myself. I know a lot of people are like, that's not true at all. But like, I don't really, I know more about your politics than I know about mine. <clears throat> and I think that's because our prime minister is a disaster and uh, I take no I take no uh, no happiness in saying that he's my prime minister right now because he's just not great. Um, <clears throat> but what I do respect is that uh, difference of opinion. And so when it comes to politics up here, I'm always one of the first to be like, oh, I'll talk about it openly because I'm I'm very I'm an open book in that sense. And I think at the end of the day, if somebody knows you the way they should know you and your character. I'd like to think that they don't, you know, base their friendship off of some of my beliefs because frankly, (laughs) if you met, if you met me when I got home from Afghanistan to now, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised I have the friendships I have and the family I have left. I'm telling you without destroying just burning everything down (laughs) like i could not have set fire to more things in my uh, opinions (laughs) and making them incredibly vocalized (laughs) i was a horrible horrible human but you find out who your friends are you know well you do and and shockingly enough most of them stuck around and i seem to attract some new ones so it's not that they're even like-minded it's just they're like they'll put up with crazy and I, don't, I am not at all like, <clears throat> you know, when someone is political, that's fine with me. They can be political all they want. That really does not bother me. Mm-hmm. I've just found for me personally. Yeah, I respect that, though. Yeah, it's like I'm I'm more <clears throat> I can relate to people better because half the time you know, I'm generally more conservative. OK. Uh, and then but I'm in the arts, which is far left liberal. <clears throat> yeah, couldn't like, be more far left not liberal but like like communist liberal in in me mm-hmm. chances and i don't mind saying i hate communism well no i don't um, think anybody minds you saying that you hate communism <laughs> it's kind of been always like one thing we avoid but like uh in my line of work i just have i have to tread carefully anyway oh, that's right. you know what i'm saying because so for one thing i have to kind of say i have to walk on eggshells yeah. generally but then i it's generally just in my private life. I'm kind of like, eh, whoever you voted for, you know, yeah, I'm, I'll still be your friend. It doesn't matter. Yeah, bro. That's cool. Yeah, yeah I, I get that. Well, especially because when you're, when you're, that's a great segue into, uh, I want to talk to you a lot about your voice acting because when Tim first told me about you, um, he was like, yeah, like I have so many vets you need to talk to. I have so many vets that do, friends that do so many different types of things that you wouldn't have necessarily thought a veteran would do after getting out or serving, getting hurt or any, you know, other reasons they're out. And um, what I loved about that was he was like, you got it, Kate, got to talk to this guy. He does voice acting. And I said, okay, tell me more. And he goes, no, 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 you're gonna have to talk to him. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to ask him. So I've been waiting to understand, number one, you joined the military, you got out. What made that jump for you? Well, the best piece of advice that was in- interestingly, as far as uh, voice coaching, was from my first platoon sergeant. <laughs> Didn't even know it. I'm from the I... Deep South, had a pretty stiff accent. Now, some people might think I have a big, you know, a, like a heavy accent. No, not, <laughs> no. Not, not from where I came from. <clears throat> no. This is very light compared to what it used to be. So when I got out to, I was in Kansas, which is, you know, Heartland, USA. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people are, uh, I mean, of course, they come in from all over. But, you know, the the town and stuff, that's good American English. That's like kind of the pristine, almost no accent to it. Even the locals, they sound like news anchors. (laughs) And uh, 
Right, right. A girl at the gas station, I, I roll into town, pay for my gas, and she was like, you know, down here, it, it'll be some hillbilly is working the counter. Yeah. There, I mean, it's some old teenage girl, and she's like, hi, thanks for coming. You know, hope you come back soon. <laughs> I was like, well, like, you you pronounce every syllable of that. That's amazing. And um, they're like, you articulate so well. Right. <laughs> and everyone's like that. So uh, when I got to my unit, I was there a few weeks and my platoon sergeant said, you need to learn to speak English because none of <laughs> us can understand you. <laughs> you that. How old were you then? 24, 23. Okay, so like you're that. pretty set in your ways there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I actually started working on, you know, speaking the King's English, so to speak in, okay. a, you know, in American style, but at least enunciating. Yeah. And, um, that actually helped because when I started years later, when I started, uh, actually acting, I didn't have to relearn all my diction. I was kind of already there. Oh, that works. And, um, so yeah, I think I, I went to uh, also with that same platoon sergeant. Um, he he had some tickets to Romeo and Juliet or something, and his wife was out of town, and I was I was single at the time. And he's like, "All right, I don't want to be weird, but uh, you want to want to go to Romeo and Juliet?" Because he like, wasn't a party. This couldn't get more uncomfortable for everyone in the situation. But yes, I want to go. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> it was like everybody you know in my unit. They're five o'clock on a Friday. And sometimes every other night they're down to, you know, Junction City at the strip club. Oh, yeah. That's that's, uh, that's never been me. And uh, so I'll just kind of, you know, go do my own thing. Well, he says, hey, he was the same way. You know, he was married. He wasn't going to go and whatever. Hey, want to go to uh, wait for it. Romeo and Juliet on a mandate. <laughs> and I said, why not? And we went and had a great time. And I fell in love with the performing arts. For the first time in my life, it was kind of like this. This is so cool. These people have memorized all these lines and they, they're the timing. They've practiced this. This is amazing. And that was one of the first times that I ever remember. Um, I mean, you watch a movie or something, but it's so highly edited. You kind of feel like it's really happening. Whereas in a play, there they are. You know, it's not really happening. You, you can see everything. And yet it's so magical in its own way and i think i started uh that was when the seed was planted of sort of performing like okay. pretending to be somebody that i wasn't or talking in a way that i don't really talk and um so yeah that was probably 2008 and then i mean years later i get out of the army i'm in um what do you call it uh, shoot, I think I'm working in a factory. Okay. You know, very uncreative uh, pursuits. Yeah, not exactly something that's creative, uh, creative inducing. No, who, not at all. Just working inside artificial light, hard floors, very rigid. Like, oh, that's not the way it's always been done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, not, not a place for an artist to flourish. Oh. And um, I think what happened was I started recording uh, readings because I just had my, uh, our, we had our first girl she's almost seven now so this would have probably been seven years ago um i started just making recordings for her God, just so she cool. could just so she could have them and um yeah so then it just started it kind of snowballed from there I that, can't even, yeah that 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 in itself like um the the idea that you did it like so selflessly but for your daughter just to have you know down the road if something ever happened to be able to be able to actually listen to those and um to look back at that and i think the only people are that privileged to that have stuff like that are, are people who are often like actors or you know celebrities they have this you know constant overview of their life that's always on tape so you know if something ever happened their kid can look back and see x right. y z but for you to take the initiative and kind of do that that's that's kind of incredible because that will be such a special thing when you're not on this planet anymore for them. That's just incredible. I love exactly. that. So much. Oh, I love that. Make gives you all the feels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the feels. So, yeah, that's a, that's exactly because I lost my dad uh, around that same time about seven years ago, and I have one recording of him. 
uh, we've got some home videos and stuff, but mm-hmm. there was one recording of him reading a passage from the Bible. And it was, man, that's a valuable recording to me. Yeah, I thought, what if, what if I could have all kinds of stuff, stories and, you know, just have a lot. Well, I, I, I respect that because you, you learned from something instead of, you know, allowing the same situation to happen. You took an action and you move forward with it in order to make that, you know, your children's lives better down the road or even your wife and things like that. Right. Cause unfortunately um, in our community, there's a lot of loss when people come home and I think it does nothing but a disservice to the families that are attached to that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really sad. So it's always, it's always great to hear people like trying to preserve their stories and their, their lives so that others can hopefully learn from them too. Right. Yep. Exactly. I think that's why I like what Tim's doing so much too, because it's, it's doing all that preservation work that nobody has been willing to take the time to do. He is doing the Lord's work, as we say down south, that is, he's doing know. some good stuff. Yeah. He, I have, you know, in the time frame that I, that I got to know him, he, he was religious, but it almost took like, a after, after I met him and then he started really, I don't know if he was started hanging around you guys more or Jesse or what it was, but he seems to really be a lot more at peace. And I just love that because I think that's a testament to the way you guys, you guys are and it rubs off on him and so I'm happy to I'm super happy to see that how did you guys all become friends my brother Jesse is a filmmaker and he worked on a uh, documentary about a Vietnam veteran that showed at a Sundance film festival at the same time uh, Tim had a photographic essay that was showing at the same event at Sundance so they were kind of thrown together. I went up there just tagging along with Jesse. Yeah. Just, you know, carry his bags, do what I could to support him. <laughs> and then, uh, and it's funny because when Jesse and Tim first met, they hated each other for like, uh, for, really? for maybe an hour. Oh yeah. Oh, Why? you get two little prima donna artists in a room. Woo. Oh, I need to see this. I can't wait for COVID to be over. Oh, it's, um, yeah. You, you get a couple of, uh, <laughs> no let it out let it little, out little alpha males okay you get alpha which they're both alpha males they're also highly no i will i will grant it to you you would not know that by looking at tim or hearing him talk or hearing him laugh but if you talk to him enough you'll find out there's an alpha down there he's an alpha like an alpha male unicorn maybe but he's an alpha you know in his own strange way What's that? He's going to kill you for calling him a unicorn. Well, I call him that to his face. So. Oh, I appreciate that so much. He'll be okay. There'll be I, those two seem like they seem like two peas in a pod. They just they seem like peas in a pod. Right, and peas in a pod don't get along a lot of the time until at least they rub off the rough edges. <laughs> oh my God, you got an answer for everything. You and your southern just you got like perfect analogies. The uh, and for. Anyone that doesn't know Tim or Jesse, Jesse's my younger brother. He's an amazing artist and he's a, uh, a former U.S. Marine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tim, also an amazing artist, um, a Army veteran. So, so they're, you know, two alpha males, but also very artistic and very emotional. Like both of these guys cried during, you know, up. And, they, you know, I think I, everybody did an up, but, you know, they'll cry in cartoons. And up. then. You get them together and get them to arguing about something. And there is some serious tension. In the room. I can't, I would love to see those two. Like, I wouldn't want them to hurt each other, but I would just love to see one of them get to a point and then see the other just like, have you, did you ever see that movie Ford versus Ferrari? Mm-mm. Oh my gosh. Great movie. And they, one of them, they're, they're like best of friends, but they're sitting there. And next thing you know, they're just arguing over something. And one just tackles the other right to the ground. And it's so like, it was so stereotypical American. They had like the old Coke bottles in their hands, like their shirts tucked in. And like, one's just like, no, you don't No, you don't. And he just takes them out. And I just can picture that happening. I feel like that would be make a really great film. Yeah. I, I, that's probably happened before. I've not seen it personally, but it would probably happen if it hasn't. That's how they, they deal with um Children. what do you call it 
yeah, they're they're a drama that they manufacture. There's, there's no <laughs> real drama. Like real drama is where we're going to buy groceries for the kids. Where we're yeah. going to buy diapers this month. Yeah. If there's no real drama, then you have to manufacture. You got to make something up, uh-huh. get ticked off, and then fight somebody. They just gotta fight. We're just fighting people now. We are now yeah. fighting yeah. people. We just need to make the drama to fight people. It happens. I get it. Yeah. Okay, can so how did you how did you go so you went from going in the military doing this and what was it did you go to school like so did you just start recording you went to school after you just how did you end up getting these gigs and doing the stuff i got on youtube i watched everything on youtube that there was to watch about voice acting good bad and ugly yeah and i gravitate towards people that say oh you can do it you know what I mean? I like yeah. that. So you can, uh, if for anyone that's like interested in that kind of thing, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube, everything from, you know, if you don't have a $1,500 mic, then don't even waste your time. Yeah. Down, it's not, it doesn't have to be down, like that. And it's very pretentious. You know what I mean? They're probably from Quebec. You know, they're just <laughs> like, yes, you get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah. don't, I don't, I, that's based on your description. I'm I don't have any personal. Out there again. <laughs> So, um, but it's kind of like, oh, you know, don't even worry about it. I like people that say, uh, no, if you put your mind to it, you can do it. And yeah. here's how you could, here's some things you could work on. That, mm-hmm. That's what I like. That's how I attack problems. If I decide I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And you can't talk me out of it. So what's the best way? That's the people I like talking to. So you're not stubborn, like at all. Well, I think stubbornness is one of the the most um the most it's the awfulest and the most wonderful quality a person can have depending on how it's directed and how it's fostered because it can go one way or the other if it's yeah. not taken and put into the right right direction yeah if you're if you're standing up for the right thing stubbornness is the best thing in the world and yeah. then when you're when you're just hard to get along with like no i want to eat at whatever restaurant and where i'm not compromising with anybody then you're just a prick you know, okay. now you're the deck. No none of us want to deal with it. Yeah. No right. one wants to deal with that. Now you're just but, being Tim. Nobody <laughs> wants to deal with that. Right. That's <laughs> what you can start saying to people, stopping a Tim. And then it'll all make sense. Yeah. yeah. Everybody, they need to go back. If someone's like, okay, who's Tim? They keep go saying back. Tim. They go, will go back. Yeah. Go back oh. and listen to Tim yeah. and you'll, you'll understand. You'll understand. Um, but yeah, so I just decided I think I'm going to make money at this someday. And so I just started working and it was several years before I started making money. It wasn't overnight, but it was long, continuous, directed effort. And then I started making money and now I make a living. So that's so crazy because if you go from like, you know, it's it's, there's literally so many people that have gone from YouTube um, to learning things from YouTube. And it's funny that you say that because I did not expect that. Um, I just picture I don't know what I picture. I picture you getting like a GI bill and like going to some school, some art school. And I just picture you like just being the Southern guy in the class and just everybody else wants to be as good at it as you, but they can't like, no matter what they do, they can't sound like you. I don't picture you picking it up from YouTube. And that's, that's a testament to showing, obviously that when you say you want to do something, you're definitely going to do it, but it's also a testament to showing your resiliency and your ability to find um, the right tools to do it. No matter what, no matter what's put in your way to do it. I think that's incredible to acknowledge because we want more people like that in this world, people that are going to take responsibility and take, take initiative and move forward and, and, you know, live life with a, with a purpose and rather than just, this, you know, looking down at our phones every five seconds and living life um, second by second <clears throat> based on likes and follows. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. When you got your first job, how did that happen? I think it was my probably my first paying job was for someone that had done some kind of a short film and they needed a like a piece done for something in the movie. Mm-hmm. And they're like, hey they'll give you a hundred bucks if you do this thing. And I was like, Whoa, that's, that's a lot of money Just to talk. Uh, for, yeah, just talk. It was basically a, it was in their pr- uh, promotion, but they were making a, um, 
a commercial for this fake product in the movie. You know what I mean? Well, so it was, it was kind of like marketing for the movie. But it, it was like an actual commercial, you might say, even though it was a fake product. Yeah. And I did that. And I was like, that was that was really fun. And I kind of. <laughs> Shockingly fun. I, uh, I, had tr- I had imitated kind of Tom Selleck. I think he's got a great uh, kind of American voice. Yeah. So I thought, well, this uh, it was kind of agricultural in nature. So I thought that would Tom Selleck agriculture. I think we could make this work. And yeah. I had no style of my own, so I had to just like imitate him, wow. which I think, which I think you have to do. I think you just find somebody you like or a few people you like and start copying them shamelessly until you develop your own style. And I mean, don't obviously say, don't hey, Tom, Tom Selleck does it like this. So that's how I'm going to do it. It's not like you are passing it off as your own, you know. Um, no, so, but yeah. I know what you're saying, though, you have to imitate. You almost have to learn from the greats. It's like when you I was just watching this, not to sidetrack. I was just watching this um, this show with my husband called uh, about the comedy store mm-hmm. in uh, L.A. And it just came out. And what what I heard, like the most of all of them saying comedians were saying is like, it's an art, obviously. And then within that art, you almost have to you have to watch, you have to learn, you have to imitate in order for you to find your own self and your own style within that within that art form. And it, you know, that doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. You're not claiming to be that person. You're learning the technique and the behavior of how somebody like that who is successful does it in order for you to be able to create your own chops for it, you know? Exactly. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I like stand up comedy, that's a whole another thing. And that goes so far beyond just writing jokes. That's oh, yeah. One, one tiny step in being a successful stand up. Yeah. Uh, comedian i mean you have to you know you gotta memorize stuff you gotta i mean that's oh i cannot imagine that joe that's i i get yeah. hives just thinking about being you get anxious like that oh i I would be terrible at that oh, really yeah. yeah i can't picture that because i think you could i think i think you would be a lot uh, a lot better at it than you think I, and I, the reason i think is because you're able to act not just have like different voices you can legitimately act and i think people who do these uh, these things where we put ourselves out in the public, there is a portion or a part of ourselves that is not, you know, I'm complete. I think I'm completely myself. I think the only thing that changes from episode to episode in the in the work that I do in the public is I either swear less or I am totally full on old military me, which was very 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 sweary. In the multiple languages, <laughs> I have no shame in that. Like I, like I know a lot of places they don't appreciate that women swearing, and so I know where to where my boundaries are. But I also know who I am, and I'm kind of not going to fully change that. And so there's just a point where it's like you can either fucking like it or you can not listen to me. So I think there's a part of us that is a persona on some level, but I think it's just a matter of turning it up or down depending on yeah so yeah i don't know it's it's a whole thing so when okay so you did this job and then did you did you get an agent did you just put yourself out online like i'm for hire no i mean this was i did some i did that and then uh i mean i can't remember what the next one was i mean it was slow i i got another one for like an explainer video on youtube for 20 bucks you know something something cheap And I did that and I really liked it. And one thing that I always try to do is I want to delight the customer. Yeah. So if someone's paying me a hundred dollars, I want them to feel like they got a deal. Oh, okay, that, okay. that was like the best hundred bucks they spent and be the best customer service. Be so polite. If they, if there was something that they're like, I don't know, I feel like we should have inflected up at the end instead of down. Can, mm-hmm. How much more would that charge? Mm-hmm. You know, what would you charge me? If, uh, you know, I'll say, I'll, I'll send it to you. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about right. it. You. you know, and then all of a sudden they see you as a solution to their problem. And they, you're creative, you're thinking along with them. And then you, you really are, have an invested interest in like making their project look good. You are and literally it, speaking. I'm pointing at both of my mm-hmm. camera and audio guys here because you you sound like them 
like, Hey, Coleman, can you do that? Yeah. Like no problem. I'll send it to you. Like, don't worry about it. Like, no, no big deal. Like I got it. The, you, you, you're right though. That works. That makes you important in somebody's life. I can't do any of this without these guys. And it's because they made it accessible to me instead of being like, I'm and like, listen, I'll be honest with you right now. There's a pretty big deal in the room. <laughs> listen, listen, let me talk about it for a second. Okay. Shh. There's a pretty big deal in the room. I won't name names, but it's kind of a big deal in modeling world, <laughs> and like kind of a big deal and soon to be like the acting world. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm just saying, like he wants to be more behind the camera. And I think he's a psychotic nut for saying that because he could <laughs> literally be making millions of dollars just by looking at the camera like this. And so <laughs> he's blushing. Yes, he's yes. blushing so hard. He's hiding behind the camera. Like they're so glad they're not on. And like, I won't ever name drop him, but I'm telling you right now, like there are just some people that underrate themselves and like my guys, Coleman and Coleman's super partner. I think Coleman's the Superman, but I think, I think he's just like the super face. Do you know what I mean? You're like, I'm going to, yeah. Like, listen, like Jake, they're going to jump. Hey, you modeled for me too, babe. Don't you even, we don't discriminate around here. Okay. Listen. Okay. So no, what all I'm saying is one day when you meet these guys, you'll be like, I get it. I get it. Yeah. We're going to be, we're going to be boys. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Trust me. You're going to be boys. You're going to love these two. They're like the coolest, coolest people ever. The only difference is, is like none of us are as beautiful as them. So <laughs> <laughs> we just all have to live in their shadow of beauty. My God, they get like, they get take pictures for a living. Somebody takes a picture of their face and is like, <sighs> I'm going to sell product. With that face. <laughs> like, yeah. can you imagine having a face like that? I've tried. I couldn't couldn't no i can't imagine i don't have a face like that i just wish i had a face like that it's like when you like your voice acting like i'm so damn jealous at your abilities it's no i've i don't see here's the thing between me and a, a a beautiful model which i don't i can't even see him so i don't you might be pulling my leg oh no trust right now <laughs> i will send you a photo after this let's tell him to come over there I don't know if he wants his face. No, I'm, okay, he's okay, whatever. Okay, I, whatever. Over here. But but here's <laughs> the know? difference. Here's the difference between him and me, as far as that goes. He's got a great face. Yeah. Like I mean, I suppose you could, you know, if you had terrible acne or something, then that would mess with it. But yeah, you've got a great face, and you there's nothing you can do about that beyond staying at a healthy weight and washing your face, probably. Wash okay. Your face. Wash your face, bro. A a voice actor. Uh huh. You do not need like a voice. You just need to be a hard worker. Oh, I like. Oh. I guarantee you, if I call, you know, like, oh, hey, how you doing? You probably wouldn't even notice my voice. No. The only reason you. The only reason people do is because they hear I'm a voice actor and then like, oh, he's got a nice voice. Everybody's got a nice voice. That's what Every, I guarantee. Unless unless you're like really talking through your nose or something. Everybody has a me nice me voice. Like... Right. Exactly. Talk I from the diaphragm. Like you're me like now. <laughs> but like, I think everybody <laughs> like I has a good voice that <laughs> it would fit with some yeah, commercial. Uh, yeah. Got you. There's always a place for it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a great message too. Like that's a great message. Like you can it's really comes down to what you're willing to put put the time into. Yeah. And there's a lot of development that goes into it on your, you know, your vocal cords and learning how to inflect uh, you know, and pause dramatically and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But that that comes with practice and for someone that it was like, I don't know, I I wish that I could do it. I just don't have a nice voice. I would say well, crap. Yeah, you do. Just start work. Just do it. You're just, you just got to do it. One foot in front of the other. That's the one thing people always tell me. One foot in front of the other. It's all you can do. Because I used to have a very high, not very high, but <laughs> You're sort like, of high. I'm setting myself up here. Well, it was very nasally. Oh. I kind of talk, kind of talk nasally, like you know, a little bit like that. And I didn't um... like it. I didn't. Like, uh, and then it got worse if I heard a recording of myself. I was like, oh, that, oh, it's awful. So I didn't even, I didn't like my voice at 
all for years. I was probably in college before. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I, I didn't like my voice. And looking back, it, I wasn't, I was being lazy. Okay. Sorry to fly in here. Uh, right. Southerners are, uh, Southern Americans, Southeastern Americans are, have a well-earned reputation for being lazy. There's some, there's some hardworking people down here, but it's very a well-earned reputation for being lazy, physically lazy. And then that shows up putting it like I, you're, I, what do you want me to say to that? Well, I mean, I mean, if you've been down here, you've, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's true. It's painful. Sorry. I can't help it. But it, it literally shows up in our speech. Oh my God. You know what I mean? It, if, if words had feet, they would be dragging them. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because how y'all doing? What are y'all doing over there? Right. It sounds, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's it like, sounds lazy. It, uh, yeah. Anyway, so. No, I have that. a. I got a. I got a ton. I mean, I. I worked with the. Hundred and first out of when I was in Fob Ramrod, um, and we were the gunners for them. And a lot of those guys, Texas, um, Mississippi, big time Mississippi. Um, who else did we have down there? We had a lot of a lot of um, Mexican California, so a lot of Spanish. That threw me because I was with a French unit there, so they assumed we just spoke English. But like my whole unit, like most of them did not. So like over the radio checks, you would get this like, you know, radio check over mur, 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 like this. And then the guys would go, what? And they go, compare radio à vous? And the guys would go, uh, I didn't understand that. Uh, come back again. Like, and they were just so confused because they're like, they're Canadian. They speak English. That's what they speak. But then it was very similar to me where I was like, these guys are from California and they speak Spanish. And I realized quickly how much Spanish is actually in the U.S. military, like just like around. It's like a second language for you guys fully. That's a trip. Yeah, That's a trip. That's it's def definitely a cultural melting pot. Um, yeah, in, in the military, which I think is great because I there I there's many a little racist Southern boy that went to the army and changed their tune when they came out yeah, they got shit whipped by somebody that they should have been shit whipped by a long time ago and learned that everybody is all the same and that we all can help each other if we all just stop being so judgy well that but also you know when you when you grow up thinking you're better than everybody or you're let's say stereotypical deep south you think you know i'm better than an african-american soldier and then when your legs hanging off by a thread that guy braves enemy fire to drag you to safety mm -hmm. you're gonna that'll that'll cure your racism real quick that'll say yeah and i think that is what it, there's more of that needed i will say there was a couple situations um won't get heavily into them there's a couple situations that i was like wow wow that's not the 1800s whoa didn't see that coming out of somebody's mouth like that and what got me the most was um I grew up I grew up in um a family um back east I'm from back east originally I grew up in a family back east and my family I come from a, a very hard-working family my dad's had seven brothers and sisters they had no running water until my dad was 12 and he was the baby of the seven like lived on a farm like really that whole kind of wholesome type upbringing, um, just minus the religion. And then I had my mom's side, which was Hungarian immigrants that came in when the Soviets invaded after World War II and escaped. Mm. So worked in a shoe factory, you know, just didn't speak English, just grind and grind and grind and, and grew what they grew. And then so I grew up with this amalgamation of, um, you know, immigration, like uh, my maiden name is Burns. So it's Scottish. So my dad's side, right? Um, in Ontario, that's where a lot, I guess, settled. I'm just learning all about this, which is kind of neat. And um, what I found with that is like when you, when, you, when you really take a look at your family, 
it is a cultural melting pot in every way, shape and form, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, because we all come from different parts of the world and we all like from different times and no one can say it's very rarely somebody can say a lineage is perfect. Right. So, yeah. you know, um, I know for me, like my grandfather, my nudge papa from Hungary, like wouldn't teach me Hungarian, would not talk about his culture, would not. So there's this weird perception of it for me, not a racist perception, but a perception nonetheless, that is very odd. And then when you, what I found fascinating is the way the U S is raised. There's so it's so drastically different. Okay. So like, if you came into the Canadian military and you had some type of racist or prejudiced belief, I'm, it gets passed through. Don't get, don't get me wrong. But what you see more of is sexist. You see more like against women because we've had women on the front lines for a long, long time. So there's always like you guys just got them recently, I think, in the past few years where if you can do the job, you make, you know, that kind of thing. We've had that. So what I found more of wasn't racism until I went overseas was I found more of sexism, uh, being a woman in a man job kind of deal. So, but like you said, you learn really quickly when you're a firefight, when the next person you look over is the five foot gunner, who's dragging your ass out of somewhere because you're in pieces. Like you're thankful at that point for that person. But sometimes it just takes that, um slap in the face into the world because some people just aren't raised properly in my opinion yeah and you can only uh you can only fault them for it so much but it is their responsibility to get their shit together as an adult in my opinion um but i'm also very opinionated so well i think it's pretty good opinion i'd agree with that opinion yeah i mean i grew up like i was saying so like um yeah that family i grew up in um my dad's side i had uh some of my family they married into the family and I have black family members and I, but they're like the idea that somebody could ever look at somebody like that for any, like that just like, boggles my mind. And when I, like I said, I served, there was a lot more of that than I expected to still be existing. And I don't know if it was necessarily because of like, just we were in a very stressful situation and people just run their mouths they don't, you know, deal with mental health well. Like they're just not at their best person, at their best state of human being. Yeah. So I try not to hold that against them. But it happens and you hear shit that you're like, oh, didn't know that was still in the world. <laughs> so yeah, that's a that's a shock to the system. But it brings up a good point though. Like sometimes people just need to be shook in a little like not not small children but like you know like a grown adults that won't get shaken baby when you when you shake them right. the uh exactly <laughs> you they, did they i good, told you they, you need a good, they need a good shaking i agree you need a good shake. You know, in missouri oh gosh here we go there are signs along i-70 okay uh-huh. there's a you know it's a main inter- inter- uh, state through the that goes i don't know east to west uh-huh. There are signs in Missouri that say, do not shake your baby. And it has a little baby up there. Why? Why? So many whys. Why does that need to be a thing? Here's my, I don't know, hypothesis. Oh, I like it. Missouri has a lot of meth. Oh. Usage. More so than a lot. Oh, I, I guess. That, so I think that it's <clears throat> excuse me, widespread enough that apparently they need to put billboards up. Uh, That's troubling to me. Not, oh, oh, it, it really is. I've never seen that anywhere else. I mean, we're I'm from Mississippi. I'm we're backwoods folks, but you, you don't have to tell no, us. No, no, you're not. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I don't need a sign to tell me not to abuse my child. You know what I mean? I think if you, I think if, uh, I don't know. I just wonder if that even works though. Is someone going to be driving along? I'm like, Oh, I didn't, I don't know. They don't give a reason. So it mustn't, I don't know. 
You know what? Th- you know what's funny that you say that too, because you think it's common sense, right? But I can remember now that you say that, because I totally. After I had Jack, you well, you don't know. You didn't push it out. You don't get it. But your hormones go insane, and I know you know that because you've had multiple humans. So, um, I've and, been associated closely with a lady that has said the same thing. So, and you. When the I remember the doctor going like we put Jack in um we put Jack in his car seat or whatever and he was he was a month early so he was like six pounds he was just like a squish and um I'm like trying to like put his tiny little things in this and she goes um also you know it can be hard sometimes they cry and they cry and I just we just remind you whatever you do put the baby down don't shake your children it's not gonna make them stop crying it's actually gonna make it worse and I'm like okay hold up. I know I'm straight up out of my like cuckoo clock right now because I don't know which way is up. And I just pushed a human out of my body with no medication. But I, the one thing I can say that has never questioned my mind is does this work to shut it up? Like, no, you don't shake a kid. It just feels like common sense. No. Yeah. I mean, I would be, if someone said that to me, I would be at a loss for words as well. Well, I'm at a loss for words from reading that sign. I want, <laughs> but you're okay. So that I want to, I want to ask about that then. So is, so that you said a meth problem. Can you, do you know about that? I don't know much about that down there. I didn't realize that was such a bad thing in that area. Well, in uh, Missouri, it's worse than some other places. Uh, but yeah, people just, you know how you have moonshiners, like you have, <laughs> People make their own alcohol. And that was real big in the 20s, especially uh, down south in the southeast United States, um, probably everywhere during the prohibition prohib- time. Prohibition time. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so there is currently a prohibition on, uh, you know, use them as water cups on, now on, on. Yeah. Illegal. I don't know. Methamphetamines, I suppose. And so you have people that uh, make them in their trailer bathtub. And I don't know how you do it, but apparently like, this is very, sure we can Google. Uh, You're the Google. yeah, I mean, I'm sure it would be, <laughs> I think the show, I've never seen the show breaking bad, but I okay, think, stop. I, I think that you need to go back and you need to watch that. I think if I had watched it, I would have a better understanding of I why you would put a sign on the road that says don't shake your baby. I think you would have a better understanding, but I also think you are missing out in an, on an incredible cinematic experience that is breaking bad. And if you are an arts guy and you appreciate that type of, you will appreciate that series. I've heard that. I have heard that. Like Brian I, Cranston's character arc is just stuff of legend. I've heard. Uh, the, yeah yeah all the guys guys are just it is it the, yeah yeah the, him that and um ozark Ozark. have you oh is that with uh jason bateman uh-huh one of my friends has been in that in a couple episodes of that oh my but god I how do i become movie. friends with that person <laughs> and go on that show oh ozark is you are wasting your life without seeing it <laughs> Well, that's a little heavy handed don't you think not if you appreciate the arts the way i do okay that's for true. somebody that will never land an acting role in her lifetime the envy i have for that <laughs> show and just because the characters there's something about the way they do the characters and the they make it so damn believable on a level that you can believe it's happening to a family in the actual ozarks because you can picture it It's about like the Mexican cartel and this family and them laundering money for them. And it turns into this whole thing where now the whole family is involved and like the teenagers are involved in it, but it's, it's done in a way where it's, it makes you legitimately question (laughs) so many different aspects of, of American culture and the way uh, that this person is successfully like, totally okay with working with the cartel because he feels oh, i'm just laundering money this whole family's i don't know it's intense though it sounds intense it is sorry i, I get real into stuff i get real into stuff and i get passionate about stuff and breaking bad and ozark <laughs> hit your nose right on the button there okay sorry I knew, yeah i've heard nothing but amazing things like yeah. i've heard that 
but no one ever quite as intensely as that right there. But I think oh. I've had several people say I should check it out. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you can just check it out. It's okay. what, so, all right. There's there's certain shows, but I, you know what? The, the minimal amount I know about you, I don't picture. Yeah, I don't picture it being your cup of tea. Like. I'm more of a comedy guy to me. Yeah. You know, I think you're the same way in a, in a way like you've had you've seen enough heaviness in your life that if that you could look at something and enjoy it. Yeah. But you could also say, yeah, I've had enough heaviness. I'd rather laugh. I'm not going to intentionally put more heaviness. Yeah, I appreciate that view because my husband has that view and I'm the opposite. I have the view on like a level, but then I'm also like, tell me all the darkness. <laughs> Show me all the darkness. I, it's because there's something attractive to that. And I don't know if it's because of the way I was taken out of the military, why I felt like I didn't get enough of what I wanted out of it because I was so, after I got hurt, I was like right out. Um, so I feel this like I didn't get enough of what I, I, I always feel this like, I don't want to say revenge is the word, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, I feel like I never got that closed book. And so yeah. I enjoy in a weird way. I, you know, I used to like, I don't watch it as much, but I enjoy criminal minds. I enjoy documentaries on like sociopaths. And I got the privilege to study uh, criminology out here. And I had a professor and, um, Ironically enough, I end up uh, Russell Williams, the Canadian colonel who decided to murder a few people uh, while mm. in uniform and travel the world and potentially murder others while also breaking into the homes of neighbors who happened to be in my my lovely town um, where wow. I grew up. So I always loved the brain. I always loved how it worked. I lo always loved not the darkness of the brain, but how somebody could be that way and maybe yeah. just the behavior of it and so that for me was um when i got to study that here i actually got to do a uh i got to do a um a research project on him and i was like spewing information that like most people didn't even know because one he was in the military which was crazy and he ran the largest air force base in canada which is insane wow. Yeah. And he, so he murdered someone from my town and then he murdered someone from the air force base. It was a French girl. I've, I feel horrendous for forgetting both of their names off the top of my head. I will correct that. Um, but what was crazy is like my cousin worked on the base and would have interactions with him. And you know, right. I, Oh yeah. I'm like super fascinated by that type of stuff. So it's not that I like the darkness. I always find the brain to be the most fascinating part of you know, a person. Um, and I, I, I always wonder how they tick. And for some reason, the idea of understanding a sociopath is also terrifying, which is kind of like adrenaline-y, I guess. It's not a word. It is now. Yeah. But you get what I mean. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I am very fascinated with sort of the mechanics of the mind as far as that goes. To me, that's fascinating. How could you be a commander and then, you know, you seem well adjusted. You probably married. You know, I don't know. Like, he how do you get from, have you never you get from there to there? Him? I don't, I mean, I, I'm sure I would have heard about him, but that name didn't, didn't well, on my radar. Colonel, it's Colonel Russell Williams, but out of respect to his victims, nobody calls him. He lost his right. pension. His wife lost his pension. Um, okay. So after we have this chat, you totally need to look in the room. I'm, I am. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what's super twisted. Okay. So he ran the air force base in Canada, which is the largest one. It's where, you know, when we have someone die, they come in, they go into the Trenton air base. That's where my, my grandfather, my mom's side actually settled in Trenton when he came from Hungary, which is super weird. And so uh, I grew up not far from it. And he lived in Tweed, Ontario, which is uh, 20 minutes, maybe 20 minutes from where I grew up. And my parents recently had a cabin on the same street and what he was known for doing was going and breaking into people's homes while they were not there. And then he would take something like a piece of lingerie or 
a sex toy if they he found one and he would leave a note on the computer like i was here i have this but you don't know what else he's done or taken or touched or you but he would do that so it was a, it was a mind thing for him and then that escalated into him breaking into homes and sexually assaulting women and not killing them, but just assaulting them. And then that escalated into, he took someone from my town. And I remember I had gone home to visit my parents because at the time I was posted to Vekietze. And um, I remember driving, it's like a good uh, seven to 10 hour drive, depending on traffic. Um, and I remember driving and I drove through that Tweed town, the small town. And I saw, I went to the gas station and I, I it blows my mind because I went to high school with this girl's brother. And um, I was started seeing like missing signs, like she's missing. And in a small town like that, like, and when I say small town, like I grew up in a town with a graduating high school class um, where I graduated of, I think it was like a hundred kids like, like tiny, like farm town, hockey players, cows, we partied on the farm, like in the barns, like peed in the bushes, like the whole drank when you're not supposed to kind of thing. And everybody had this unspoken rule there, but nobody really ever did anything that was out of, you know, that bad. Um, drugs were prevalent in the small towns like that, like you were mentioning, like drugs can really run rampant quickly. And um, yeah, she went missing. And I remember seeing the signs and, uh, and then I got a call and my mom called me. She was like, did you hear what's going on? And I was like, no. And um, I found out and I was like, okay. So his wife, they had a second home in Ottawa. And our, that's our capital of Canada. Small, right. again, incredibly small for a capital. But he had a place in a um, just like a suburban cul-de-sac and they raided. I don't know how it all got figured out. I, I can't remember at the top of my head because I don't want to misquote, but it all got it came back to him. And at this point, he had now killed two people and the one was the other one. And um, they went in and raided their houses and found garbage bags full of women's lingerie and underwear and photos polaroids of him in it like wow, what a full, like full-on criminal minds movie like crazy and um what they find most troubling is he traveled for work he was the highest you were getting he was a commander he was our air force commander for canada for god's sakes so he was traveling the world so they're like, wait a second, hold on. Now they're going back and they're looking at people who have gone missing when he was in the country, women who were raped when he was in the country, like all these crazy things are coming out. And so that was, I mean, that was intense. So it's not like I'm not interested out of pure nature. I have it. I kind of, this happened in our area, right? Yeah. That's a lot. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. But that, unfortunately i find that stuff fascinating like weirdly fascinating yeah but i, I narrated a a uh, series called evil next door it's like a crime true oh my crime god i know what that is yeah i totally watched that of course i Did watched you? that so well i mean yeah but yeah thanks man so you were in it well i narrated it you narrated that's you yeah, if it's the same evil next door that I did. I'm yeah. thinking of. Hey, is it was that one on what channel was that one on? I, I think it was on it was it was on a streaming channel. I think it's one of the places was Fox Nation. Yeah. That's where I know it was on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it was it was um, the same one because they streamed it up here on it was like A and E or something like that. It was like we had a it was up here and you could stream it and you could I PVR'd it. Okay, nice. I'm a PVR person and then I go back and because I can only like you said, I can only handle so much darkness. Yeah. Like there's a time and a place for it. What we all want it, like I'll be like I can watch that. But then there's some days where it's like I need I need family guy. Yeah. I just need or American Dad. <laughs> Do you watch either of those? 
I used to, when I was in college, I watched Family Guy. Now that I got three little kids in the house, I am limited on what I can watch because it's always like Peppa Pig 24 7 over here. So, but hard, man. <clears throat> so I have to, um, you gotta watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got a lot of, yeah, I, I, I did enjoy, uh, Family Guy. That was back a, in college. That was funny. Yeah. Just, that just made me feel like a complete douchebag mom. I don't watch it with Jack present. He's four now. He, he's, he watched, he was into Peppa there for a minute and he like, we would read books and he would make me do the voices. Um, because I don't do them very well, but I always added the snorts. So he was like super stoked. And then my husband and I would do it together and it, we would read it and he'd be like, mommy, let's do Peppa. Like it hurts. Okay. You can't, I don't have the capacity to keep this up. <laughs> my gosh. Well, you must get that a lot. Your girls wanting you to do voices for them. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. They, they do as many as I do. So. You know, a lot really? Of so you got them started young. Yeah. The, I mean, I don't think you have to tell most kids not. To, I mean, most people have done impressions until they got too old and boring to keep doing it. Did you think most, it's something most that people do out? impressions? What's that? Do you think it's something that gets pushed out? Like as you get older, like that, that idea that you shouldn't be joking around or kidding around. I think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but in my case, I know that when I was little, I liked trying to imitate somebody off of a show or a cartoon and then later on you know okay i'm a you know a college graduate maybe i'm an army officer maybe i ought to act more my age and a little more mature and then i think you start losing that if you kind of embrace that i like and that then, that's what happens yeah and and you can do that with anything you know well i'm the president of this bank so i probably shouldn't be doing stewie griffin at Why the, not? At the, you know, the oh, drive through gosh. window, you know. <laughs> so, that, anyway. but I, you know, I think I think that people who choose to follow the path that um, is is definitely more worn down, and that is that sense of going into the military, you know, doing that, doing the the job, that the stable job, the the nine to five, or the you know those types of jobs and those types of careers. You see, you see a hardening of personalities like the longer they're in it and then you hear about you hear about people who get out of the military and they they just never break through that hard that hard barrier and I, it's it's weird to me because personally being in the military people are super funny like it could be offside humor, but they are so, there are some seriously funny people and you don't get that way by being buttoned up and serious all the time. Like you, you've got to have let it loose sometimes. Yeah. I think it's a definite coping mechanism when you're surrounded by, let's say burning sand, as far as the eye can see, and you've got, you're eating out of a vacuum packed bag <sighs> and you're taking a dump in a hole you dug, like you better have a sense of humor. You're going to, Blow your brain you die. <laughs> yeah. your brain is going to die and you're yeah. going to cry in a little hole because you if you don't if you're if you don't have that you can, your brain cannot compute what you're seeing no you really can't and that's before the the horror starts that's just that's just the <laughs> nice parts this is just situational <laughs> shit i'm dealing with it's just really hot i just really need to poop and i just don't have a bathroom like this is the only situation and i remember that <laughs> because this is <laughs> This will tell you how screwed up some of my service was. We were outside the wire and I had to pee so bad. We had just literally finished a firefight. And this is when I was with the British. So I was the only woman up there. And I said, if, if someone doesn't like, I need to go like, pee, like you can't like, I'm not even going to try to do the British accent. Cause I worked, they were Scottish, Irish, English, South African and Fijian. I can't. Nice. And all of them were all one military yelling at me and I, their accents were some of the Scottish accents were so un uh, literally I could not understand radio transmissions, anything. So I said, somebody needs to like clear a spot because I'm going to pee on you. And so they got out one of our guys and he gets out the, the metal detector and he's well, let me see if I have him. He's this guy. 
<laughs> the little mind sweeper. Their mind sweeper. <laughs> and so we're inside the, we're inside, we just cleared a house. We're inside of it. And um, he goes, I haven't cleared the rest. So don't go anywhere. Hold on. He goes out in front of me and he's walking, goes a couple of feet. Don't go there. Don't pee right there and don't move. Don't, don't step outside that little box. You will blow up. Just go pee there. I'm like, oh, okay. But your brain has to have some type of way of coping with that. Or otherwise, you're going to have a meltdown at the thought of IEDs being on either side of you while you pee in 55 degree heat and in front of a bunch of dudes. I just think you need to have that humor. And what makes me sad is when I see people get out of the military, lose that. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, do you think it's a camaraderie thing they lose? Well, I think it has to be a lot of the time because, uh, I mean, there are some real loners. I mean, I think we've all seen lone wolves, but most of the time when you get out, I know I can speak for myself on this. I do not miss the army. I miss some of the training, yeah. all the ranges, any kind of <laughs> weapons range. I always enjoyed that. And then I enjoyed the, the <laughs> folks I was with. I really like them. I keep up with a lot of them. You know, I just, the people, I miss the people. I don't miss the army, but I miss the people. Yeah. I, the gentleman I had on before you here, he was a Royal Marine and um, English guy. And that's what we said. It was, you know, the people you, you serve with, it doesn't matter really the country or the, the sex or the gender, or the color, or the whatever. When you, when you serve with someone at all, there is a bond. I don't care what any of you say. I don't care if you like me, you like me deep down because you know that even though you don't like me in person, you know, I'll have your sex no matter what, like there's that, you know? And, um, I think that's, it's hard getting out, um, seeing people, you know, some, like you said, there's the lone wolf to see they'll kind of dissipate. And, but did you find that, um, when you served, you had a lot of, um, what I saw it in some of the units I served with a lot of, uh, just like clashing. I mean, I guess some, sometimes, but it wasn't, um, I mean, that's not all I saw. I mean, I think I was in a pretty good unit. Um, now I was an officer and, you know, I don't know how it is in Canadian army, but you know, in the American army, you know, you have the, you don't want to have the fraternization. So, you're not going to be as close with the enlisted guys. Uh, I was in all male, you know, that's why I keep saying guys. Uh, no, no, you go ahead and say guys. It's fine. I, most of the people I speak with and, and, and 90% of the people that have probably listened or are going to listen, um, the people I serve with were guys. I have right. girls, but not as many. It's fine. Right, right. The, um, you know, so there's, there has to be that distance there. Mm -hmm. I don't agree. You know, I'm, that's one of those rules I don't agree with too much. I mean, like I would, uh, I would have some, counterparts lieutenants on my left and right they were like oh i'm never gonna ever talk to an enlisted guy outside of a formation and i think that's ridiculous so you know kind of how i i talked to my commander <clears throat> where i kind of drew the line was look if if i'm gonna be in harm's way with these guys and we you know we might be bleeding on each other mm -hmm. uh, i'm gonna let them know that i'm one of them and i value them and and um i'm not too good for them so i will I would like, uh, you know, on Saturday, go over the house, go over to the apartment, wherever they're getting together, you know, have a, uh, have a burger, watch, watch football a little bit. And then before it gets too late and everyone starts getting too crazy, you know, I'll, I'll head on out. Yeah. Before the alcohol starts blowing and people start throwing, throwing punches, you need to just. Right. I'll let, I'll let them do that on their own and I'll. Let the children play. The adults go to bed now. Right. That's kind of, that's all it was. Yeah. And, um, and so there was a little bit of. <clears throat> Um, th there was some head button, I guess, with other me with other lieutenants who didn't, because I generally don't it like officers. No, no, but I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. And I will voice that nobody likes officers. It's, it's like this idea that we're going to, you give them a comp. If you want to get lost, you give an officer a compass. That's like the running joke. I, I respect officers. I'm just, just shit well, I, seriously. In my case, I was, I was the best with a compass of anyone I've ever met, including all the, I grew up because in the swamp. You, so I was good before I went in. Yeah. You knew, you knew how to handle life before you even became an officer. That's why you were successful at it. 
Well, the thing I, I don't like, uh, generally don't like officers though. The, the people that love officers are officers <laughs> and no, you know, nobody likes a narcissistic a-hole. Uh, I know I don't. So most, most of the officers, and oh. I can say this that I dealt with, I, some of them were fantastic, but most of them were out to punch a ticket to their next assignment so they could uh -huh. work at, you know, the Pentagon or, you know, get their dream location in Hawaii or Italy or whatever. And they were not in it for the guys in the unit. So they yeah. go, go out and come home safe. Mm -hmm. They were there to, you know, win medals and get their, you know, their evaluation report nice and pretty and all that stuff. I still That's don't understand that like. mentality. I don't understand that mentality. And here's why. I think if you're going to go uh, deploy with someone, you better be on the same page with them. And I saw that with, this is where I found the difference between um, my actual unit I deployed with and the unit I actually served outside the wire with. And that was the difference. Some of my staff members would be, uh, they are the people that the reason I'm alive today, because they saw what was happening after I got hurt and were like, okay, like they knew signs and they knew she doesn't act like that or say those things or react that way or be that kind of disrespectful unless so, like there was some serious Serious stuff. I mean, that happened. And after that, I just, I was literally not the same in human being. I, from the week they saw me when I left to when I came back, I was not the gunner. They even understood. I, I would rip your face off and come at you if you even looked at me the wrong way because I felt like you were att coming, like actually attacking me to kill me. So it got, I got to a point where I'm grateful for those very few people they were not the, you know, the big majority. The majority was very much, you don't mingle with, you know, the grunts. You don't, you don't, you know, you don't show them that side of you. And I almost think people would fare better and probably be more open when something traumatic happens outside the wire and how it's truly affecting them, whether it be a male or female if their staff members made them feel like you could have that conversation with them and they weren't going to look at you like you were an idiot, weak or pathetic. They were going to look at you and go, thanks for having the balls to have a conversation with me and let's fix the problem so that you can have longevity in this career rather than you not being able to come to me and say, you know, sir, this is going on. Normally they'll look at you and go, and like, there's no, do you know what I mean? They don't, if you don't show that with your staff or your, or your, the guys under you, people won't respect you the same. <laughs> you're just a taskmaster. You're a, mm -hmm. you're a manager, but you're not a leader. And that, yeah. And being a leader is the, is the difference between surviving outside the wire and, and have like, sorry, having a leader is, has the difference between surviving outside the wire or not. And that's my, that's my view and what I've seen. But yeah. I can only speak from personal experience. So, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of people out there that are great at what they do. But from a leader's perspective, if you're going to take people outside the wire on foot or in a tank or in a plane, you better be able to lead them through some shit if it goes down. And I better be able to believe that you're going to be there for me, too, even though you've got two bars on your chest and I've got a Chevron, you know, exactly. Um, I think that's where we we let a lot of our soldiers down. I think that's where we lot, let a lot of our veteran community down. And I think that's where you, you see the, the cracks start to deform, start to form when you get out. Some people may, and you know this because you guys have this, you, you guys have this in the States a lot. And uh, it's where uh, somebody who's an officer is married to somebody else. And that somebody else also think that rank uh, follows yeah. them. <laughs> right. I've seen that. What is that called? You guys have a name for that, don't you? Oh, I don't know about that particular one. I know a dependipotamus is generally someone that, uh, yes, that marries and it's not exclusive to officers though, which is why I say, but yeah, yeah a depend a dependipotamus is someone that marries a government worker, basically. Okay. You don't, and the higher the rank, the better they've got a, Oh, they've got a chart back at their place. And they know the pay scale and okay, if he's got six years in, then he's a, Oh, 
three, then he'd be making, you know, they know all that. Assuming my pension. If I leave oh, him yeah. here, he'll have this left over and I'll get this. And as long as I'm married this long. Right. As long as we have the SGLI and if he, you know, gets hit by a bus over there, then, you know, then I'll get 400,000 for his whatever. And then yada, yada, yada. Oh, they've planned it. And then, yeah. So then all they have to do is go down to the old local watering hole and get them a whatever uh a government worker that's going to get paid twice a month regardless of what uh of how good or bad they are you know what i mean and then if he's deploying that'll be even better because he gets the separation pay from his honey which i don't care anything about him but we'll be separated and there'll be more money i'm in the gonna bank. be sleeping around on this side oh, yeah. I, i'm gonna come back and i'm gonna be eight months pregnant right that happened one of my soldiers I had that. Uh, and I had, I came in on the kind of the tail end of this guy. He had, he had three kids and one of them was his and he'd been deployed twice. And he knew about it. Like that was the thing. I was just like, man, I don't know whether to commend you for your undying true love or say oh. you're pathetic. I don't, I'm not sure. He's I don't got know what to say. On him. But like that, that was like, wow, man, every time you go away, you have a new kid when you come back. You That's shouldn't really have. Cool. I don't know if you know how that works. Have you taught him about how the physiology and the biology works from the body? Well, I, I didn't take it upon myself as his platoon leader to uh, teach him that. I was hoping he had already got that block of instruction. So you're a better person he... than I am because I would have pointed that out wholeheartedly. Listen, son. I don't know if you know about life. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure she cannot get pregnant if you are not physically in the country. Uh, I don't know what you're telling yourself, uh, but those those kids ain't yours. Mm -mm. I, I mean, good for you for looking after them, but uh, that's that takes a special kind of person to to have that kind of understanding. I I can't say I would be the same. Yeah, and he, I I will say he was not in my platoon, so it was not affecting uh, my unit's morale or whatever uh, preparedness. But it was kind of like, does you know, does he? Does he think they're his? Because he was gone longer than the gestation period of a, you and know, homo sapien. Looks uh, nothing, nothing like him. Exactly. Like, and, and if we're being very honest here, the, this guy was very pasty white. I mean, he's whiter than me. And the dad was the cook at a Mexican restaurant. I mean, he was Hispanic because that's where the wife worked also. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it was like, you know, this, you, this is, this is, this, this child is half Mexican. <laughs> Why is nobody addressing the pasty Mexican in the room? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. We love him. He's special that way. But why is nobody saying this? It, it was, it was awkward every time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, there's I, a lot of that that goes on. Well, a lot of that. Depend upon us. You know. Oh, yes. That, yes. I appreciate yeah, the, that. That's the root of all evil around an army base is the old dependent upon us. Yeah, it's true. And I know that because I heard all about it when I deployed. I did not realize how young a lot of American soldiers get married. And I did not oh, yeah. realize how quickly they deploy after training until I was chatting with a friend of mine. And he was like, yeah, I was married like before when I rated weight room return 18 because I was deploying and I wanted her on my benefits and <laughs> and then he gets a call halfway through to her and everything's gone I heard that story more times than I can count in a six-month period mm -hmm. that was terrifying and it was always 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 the southern voice really yeah interesting yeah and I don't know if it's because it was a um, the view on maybe relationship and 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 how you know you, difference in in how people are when they date and when, if they can have sex and if they can and if you get married then you it's I don't know a lot of some of these well some of these guys were super very very religious so I think that went with their faith and how they view things so you know the high school sweetheart that whole kind of thing um but it was i i only ever heard it from um from from guys from like texas interesting i felt real sad interesting yeah i don't i don't have a hypothesis on that i don't know how that would work. i don't i don't know either I, I don't know what it was but it was just one thing though i was just i remember going back and going 
oh my god there's so many people <laughs> what yeah. is happening i would be less wary of a high school sweetheart than i would someone that you met at a strip club but it obviously it, it happens if you're 18 you know let's let's think long and hard about this regardless of how long you've known her exactly in my case a lot of the time that i saw it was just like you know you show up here let's say july and then you your first week out you you know see your first pair of boobies and yeah think you're in love and then you want to get married and then within a month oh she's happy to do it because she's a dependent and she's got the pay scale and then all of a sudden you deploy <laughs> And then when he gets that call six months in the deployment, no one is surprised. No. In fact, they're a little relieved for him. So that that can just get out of his life and be over with. Right. It's like, all right, you weren't making that much money anyway. It's yeah. all gone. Now yeah. just open a new account and we'll just start over just with everything. On. How about that? Yeah. Just okay. Yeah. That's, that's a good idea. Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah, let's go to the strip uh, club again, though, when we get home. And then let's yeah. do this all over again. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. I remember after basic training, when they first let us out, when they very first gave us our first weekend of like, all right, you didn't mess up this week. Everybody did inspection goods. You can go out for the 48 hours, but don't, don't mess it up. So we go, we go out and we go it, it, beeline. It, it was like a beeline. They look, where is the nearest strip club that I can go to immediately? And so especially in basic. I mean, I was, how do I say it? There were girls in basic that were good at stuff. Then there was me and I would crush their souls because I enjoy watching souls crush when they suck at PT. So <laughs> it brought me some pleasure. And so I didn't really hang with them too much. So off we go to this strip club first weekend out and I, you know, I grew up around whatever. I didn't, you know, I've not said I've been to a strip club before 18, but I went, I went and I just kind of like sat back, but I watched these children who thought they were men just get screwed out of thousands of dollars. And I sat back and laughed on repeat because it was so obvious. It was painful, but everybody else, like these women were like, this is too easy. Like, are you kidding me? It, it's sad, but that happens all the time. Yeah, that guy will be convinced he is the only man she's ever talked like that to. Only he, man he, ever talked like this. Looking, yeah. He's just a, you know, whatever about him. He those just, things too, and promise those things too, and just needs a man that can save her, save her out of the life of stripping. <laughs> the best i'm sorry if people aren't in the military that are listening to this it's honest to god like the truth we find it everywhere but if, if you what okay this is maybe me hearing this but i've heard stories that if you want to meet certain type of military members there are certain bars you go to in the states so for example if you wanted to meet a Air Force guy, you go here. If you wanted to meet an Army guy, you go here. But if you really wanted to meet the elite, you go to a certain bar for Special Forces people. And I don't know if that's true, but this is what I've been told. So is that a thing? Are there like particular places and bars that I don't know about? I don't know. The only thing that I I'm I'm not saying that's not true, uh. just from my personal experience. Um, I mean, shoot, if I was a a Green Beret or a CAG guy, you know, some kind of special forces, I wouldn't want to hang out with the guys I was hanging with. So I'd probably, yeah, I'm sure that they've got their own little spook hideouts that nobody knows about. And maybe except the ladies. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. In, in my experience, the um, Army bases generally, I don't know how they pick bases. Marines and Navy are obviously near the water. Makes Most sense. Most, most of the time. I mean, there's actually a Navy base that's a, it's more of an aviation base uh -huh. right near me, four hours from the, the water, which is weird. But anyway, there's that most are kind of on the water. Man, I think when they were passing out locations, the army was just at the back of the line because everywhere is just like, oh, God, that's the that's the swamp. Oh, that's the prairie. Oh, that's the, the frozen tundra. And it's like. 
<laughs> so the army is in all these awful places for the most part. There's a few yeah. nice ones, but then that's the only thing in town. So, so I have heard of that kind of thing, except it's more like the officers or the young officers go over there, older officers and maybe, you know, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. but it's still all army where I was. I was never in a place outside of a, you know, a base in Iraq or something that had multiple, mm. um, you know, military personnel, but that could be, you know, in some larger cities that have, you know, I don't know, on the, along the coasts, maybe, yeah, maybe that's go. more of a thing. Yeah. San Diego, something like that. Yeah. I can picture that. I can see that back in like Florida and stuff like that, where they have yeah. those, those mm -hmm. people in New York and whatnot. I know I've, um, I got the opportunity to, I've, I've chatted with a few SF guys and, um, my God, I don't know if it's me or, or if it's just the fact that they're just so much like cooler than me, but it like, I can't, I try to have talk to them about stuff. And I'm like, I, you, I can't, what am I going to compete with? I can't, I can't talk to you about anything. Cause you're just the shit you have done, the, the stuff you've seen and the people you hang out with. I can't, I can't compete with that. That's ridiculous. I don't, I don't think I've ever met a, uh, army special forces guy, officer or enlisted that I didn't like. They're the nicest they're people. They're called the, their their nickname. I was like the quiet professionals or whatever. Yeah, they're just nice. They'll rather talk about you than themselves. They don't brag. Now, I'm sure they're out there. I've never run in, into any that did. Uh, I mean, they're they're highly trained. They know they're cool, so they don't have to remind you every five seconds. They're and just then cool. they're just chill. They're cool. They're cool dudes. And they look, um, they look fast. You just look like I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to take something from you by accident. Yeah. And they're generally in good shape, you know? So I, I like, I like the, uh, the special forces guys. Yeah. We don't have a lot of them well, that I know of out, out on the West coast of Canada. The, the more majority of our, what you would call like the special forces in the Hill, we call it the Hill is East coast. So I got to, I got to, uh, when I was doing retraining, when I came back, we did, um, I worked at a range, a Connaught range, and it was one of the, the world's largest, um, uh, competitive shooting ranges and uh, so we worked with like the rcmp which is our federal like fbi yeah. um and then but with horses and then so we we with had the that sweet red uniforms and the smoky bear hat have you seen those pants their dress pants they have like the, like the riding pants with the bloomers that, out to the side yeah like that it's all you know what those remind me of they remind me of like um what's it called like alice in wonderland you know that like the, the, when the pants come out on the jesters and they walk around right. like that. That's all I picture when I see that. And that's because my girlfriend is RCMP and so is her husband. So every time I picture them in dress uniform, I can't help myself. Like, it's just, I respect them so much, but at the same time, I'm like, oh God, I can't. Your dress uniform hurts my soul. Um, I look like a 12 year old boy in mine. So there's not really much more I can say uh, to argue against that fact, but we have, so they, they come and they shoot and then we have like provincial cops, but then we also have special forces will come up and shoot and compete with each other and stuff like that. And um, I remember because it's actually attached to a protected bird sanctuary and like fisheries. So yes. part of the, yeah, it was, it was, a, we just love nature. I love nature. So we just great. love it so much in Canada. We just we have to surround everything around it, and we have to talk about it and be and be protecting of it at all times. So, beside this range that just shot up massive rounds on a regular basis, um, there was this attachment, and uh, so we have a drive around in the big SUV, and you'd have to go watch for birds and make sure nobody electrocuted themselves on wires because we had an eagle do that one. <clears throat> the saddest thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so we're going and we're doing all of this and we come back around and all I hear is and I look up and I see, I see uh, like, I see a, what you guys call black hawk, but I see a griffin come in and it's the JTF are doing fast roping. Nice. I, like, I want to play. Please let me play. And nobody will let me play. I was really sad. I just they, made my point about it. The, uh, yeah, they have a little school over here called Air Assault that you have to go to before they'll, I mean, not, I mean, I'm sure you can do it without it, but that's kind of the fast roping school Ugh. that you go through. And it's, that's yeah, fun. I, I was never in a fast rope unit, but I did go to that school and it was, you know, it was 
got to play. Yeah, we never got to do any of that because we were working on the M777. So the whole concept of my life was learn how to lift heavy things and pull strings real hard. So, you know, I didn't get to fast rope, but a cool shit. <laughs> I'm really jealous of it, though. I feel like in another life, I'm going to be a special forces person. You probably will. I'm going to I'm going to aim for it. I don't know what I got to do to make that happen. I just know it's what of... happened for me. And I'm so damn envious. Like watch a lot of YouTube videos. Oh no, because then I'm going to be like that guy that started basic training with me who said to me, and I quote, I'm super good at halo. So I decided to join the army. <laughs> well, what are you doing here? son? He VR the first week when we had to do nine, we were on the ninth floor. So we had to do stairs every morning down to PT, run your 10 K, run your bass back up and then go down and get your breakfast. And so he couldn't, ha he couldn't hack it. Um, so that was one of my greatest achievements to watch that, that soul sign his piece of paper out because he was a shit pump and I couldn't take it any longer. Ted Gammon. What, 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 I don't know what makes people say things like that. Um, I think it's this, uh, the fact that, I mean, this kid was young. He had done cadets his whole, like, early adolescent life. He was 17, so his mommy, daddy signed a piece of paper for him to go to basic early, which, good for you. Um, but he was a gamer. And for whatever reason, because he was in cadets, he figured he could hack it in, like, real life, where people do this for, like, a real career. Um, yeah, he didn't end up, he didn't end up making it through. Yeah, it was really not a shock, really. Well, I'm sure he was really good on Call of Duty or whatever, so I, that's good. You know, I don't play video games, but... There, there's something to be said uh, about that new, um, there's a new game and I want to say, didn't Tim just interview the guy that they based the character off of? He might have. I know he knows several people that have been on there. There, there no, there's this gentleman though. I was showing Coleman and... Um, new Call of Duty. Yeah, new Call of Duty, I think it was we were talking yeah, about. Yeah. He, but I think he just did an interview, and, and um, I remember seeing it, and I actually saw it on, it was like a show talking about, like, military or whatever and, and gaming, and I saw it, and I was like, why do I recognize that guy's face? And then I scrolled through, and I'm like, oh, my God, that is the coolest damn thing in all of time. It's not like I know anybody that's going to do video games. Yeah, I really like how, how they uh, have done it. They've got several guys that they've based uh, characters off of. So instead of just grabbing a mo a pretty model, they get a real like force recon guy. He can run really fast. You don't know what he's capable of. I've seen that guy lunge like no one's business. <laughs> Laugh it up. I'll never say who you are and I will never say what you do or what it's for. But I am telling you right now, as soon as this is done being recorded, you're going to meet this beautiful face. <laughs> I look forward to that. Yeah, I can't, you know, it's one of those things where you go to Italy, you see a sculpture, you're like, who did they base them off? It's nice. That's ridiculous. <laughs> he thinks it's ridiculous, but see, this is my, this is one of my favorite things in the whole wide world to do, and it's make people uncomfortable. I do it because one, it brings me severe amounts of pleasure um, on, a, on an emotional level. And on, and on the other, I just, there's something about being able to just look at somebody and, and say the things that, that just evoke such, like deep weirdness in like they just can't why did that person just ask me that like they're so disgusted in the fact that who would even come up with that question and then i'm like me i would it makes me happy inside so i will never stop making them uncomfortable um okay i need to know how did you meet your beautiful beautiful wife let's see i was living in Kansas. I got a text from a guy that I had um, that I knew really well. And he said, you have to meet this girl. Kind of like you, you're coming home in a month. I know you are before you go to Iraq. You have to take this girl to coffee. And I was like, I don't have to do anything. I don't want to do. Oh, there goes and, the he, again. and so he uh, he's like, no, seriously. OK, so then he he is sincere about it. Yeah, he's a really good friend. And I said, OK, I will ask her to coffee for you, not for her. Not for, for her or me. <laughs> Just for you. And so, um, and the girl was, I had uh, seen her 
as far as she she worked at the uh, fitness center. So you she had seen me. First. No, I really didn't. Okay. Uh, we'll stick with that. I I had seen her. I knew he was who he was talking about, and she <laughs> she had stalked me though. Good. Which is funny. Yeah. Good for her. Yeah. Um, and then so we met up. So it was a blind date, but at least but not totally blind. I like. I knew what she looked like, you know, when I walked up. Okay, that's her. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we had never so much as said hello to each other. And um, so, yeah, we kind of hit it off. And uh, the rest is history. That was, I don't know. How long you all been married? Uh, 10 years Friday. <gasps> that's so cute. If the world still exists after today, congratulations. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> doesn't explode tonight we'll be we're attached to you so i'm fucked too <laughs> I know. and do you know why because i live on the border i can see america <laughs> it's troubling <laughs> i don't have enough guns i'm not yeah, ready I, for it. i'm not ready and you're looking at uh you're looking at old seattle and portland down portland way that's so uh, no Oh, <clears throat> oh no! I'm fine out where I'm at. I've got I've got plenty of guns and ammo, I, and neighbors with guns and ammo all around me. I'll, I'm I'm optimistic. I feel like you and your family, because you guys have a really unique. And t correct me if I'm wrong. And I don't. I mean, this is me just totally airing out your life. But I think your life is uh, such a beautiful thing. I think a lot of people's lives uh, could use a little bit more of what you guys have, and that is like you really have a tight knit family. Um, and one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, besides obviously your service, your incredible career, and your willingness to put the effort in and create a new job for yourself that you really truly believed in and you found passionate, you found fulfilling, and you found that it could actually feed your family. So those are the three things you always aim for. Um, but what I want to know is when you know when you when you got out of the military, you you have correct me if I'm wrong three three or four brothers total. How many are you? How many do I have? Yeah. I've got eight. I've got eight. Holy! And, and four sisters. So Tim yeah. did not brace me for this. Yeah. I was told. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, back up. I have so many questions. <laughs> Don't you all live close together? No. All of us. Okay, but there are most, most of us. Yes. Most of us live close together. Yeah, and and it's is it on the same land? Uh, no, but it's, it's, uh, it's a like, lot of us are on the same street. You know what I mean? Like there's, I have, um, you know, mom's house and then I live across the street from her mm -hmm. and then my brother lives across the street from her on the same side of the street as me. Yeah. And then another brother lives on her land and a sister and her family live on kind of the backside. So it's a, on another road, but it's on mom's property. So we, a lot of us live close this is what i mean though do you know how cool that sounds that sounds like built in like you you have company all the time you have family around all the time your kids get to grow up in an environment where literally for miles any direction they go the only person they're going to know is their family member and they get to live a life that like most kids will never get to experience out here because of land being worth a bajillion dollars like it's just not going to happen and to be raised like that i was raised similar like that not i don't have that many siblings i have one um and he flies his own flag he he he's a welder an incredibly hard worker he's one of those guys where it's like um well uh, this is hard, but I know I'm good at it. So I'm just going to get better and better. I'm going to work towards, I'm going to work towards, I'm going to try. And then eventually I'll get there. And he gets pissy at me because he's like, I wish it was as easy as it was for you. And I was like, you think it was easy here, do you? You think boobies and a cute face works for everything? It doesn't. Because guess what? I've tried and it doesn't. So all I'm saying, I'm saying to him, I'm like, you know, you will get there in time, right? But Here's the thing that you have that I wish I had. And I think so many Americans and Canadians and even Brits that are gonna to listen to this wish they had. And that is that having your family right there. To have that family right there. To live across from your mother at the age that you are. To have your kids have that relationship. 
I'm, I have a brother across the country of parents I don't see because they are truck drivers due to their career, which is their choice. I'm proud of them for it. Um, but I don't have any family out here. Yeah. I have my husband's family, which is obviously my family and my second mom and my, my second super Jewy dad. And he hates when I say that, but I love how Jewish he is because it makes him this incredible, creatively wild human being. And he's so freaking smart. It's painful as much as I, oh, I drive him. I dr- I make him never want, like he hates seeing me sometimes because I just, I just can't stop poking at him because it's too easy. It's like Larry David. It's like, I just want to, you make, it's too easy. It's, it, it's, it's comic. It's too easy. So, I mean, I have an incredible support system that I can't even live without, but I have a mother-in-law and a father-in-law and a few cousins out here that are my husband's cousins that I've taken on as family. I don't have, I don't get to see my mom the way you guys get to see your mom. And that's so freaking special to me. I just think it should be acknowledged that, you know, you're, you're doing something right because I've followed your wife. I'm a creep. I creep. It's fine. Right. Kind of shame in that. I creep. I creep on Jesse's wife. I creep on all your babies. Uh, I creep on the friends that hang around you. And I can't help it. And I got no shame in it. So I just, I'm just telling you, I think one of the reasons that you're so incredible to talk with is your view on the importance of family. And I'd just love to hear, you know, how you how you think about that and how you, you know, deal with mental health within the family, especially being a veteran, because you have multiple veterans in your family, like a lot. So how does that all how does that all work? Well, I think if you you really love somebody. <laughs> if you love somebody. Sorry, I just heard the song. Your accent got me. If you really love somebody, it's a country song waiting to happen. Yeah. But seriously, if you really love somebody, uh, and not, and I don't mean just in your own family, if you're a, a lovely person that just loves people, mm-hmm. you know, so that no matter what somebody looks like or, or whatever is different about them than you, if you just, Hey, you're all right with me. If you just have that attitude, mm-hmm. you're, one, it's good for your own health, you know, cause so many people they're so offended by everything everyone does and their blood pressure is through the roof and they're going to die of a heart attack like just chill out man just quit being so bad about everything and you probably you know i don't know at least feel better yeah. and uh because there's nothing you can do about it yeah i cannot do anything about you know the u.s you know u.s cavalry's policy towards the native americans in the 1850s can't do it damn thing about it don't yell at me about it <laughs> right i i certainly don't condone it yeah. you know so it, it's kind of like there's some things it's like i think you can acknowledge like that was that was horrible you know let's never do that again you know there's so many things we can do about it mm-hmm. but just to get mad at the u.s in general because we used to have some real bad policies you know i don't think it's constructive i think it i think i like to look forward anyway with family you know, you, um, I think it's a wonderful thing to have people over. We're always having people over, especially my mom. That's kind of the hub of activity. That's We're always having people from, you know, Mississippi state, uh, university is right near us. And so there's a lot of internationals. There's mm-hmm. people from all over the world there. So we'll be having, you know, people getting their doctorates from India Mm-hmm. over here and um you know a german soccer player and you know just cultures from all over the world and yep. they come here and they hang out with us and we love them and they love us and we just have a wonderful time and we i think it's wonderful to you know find someone oh you're from you know goa india tell us about uh what is that like what is that was that seaport you know mm-hmm. what's your exports what you know what do you do for fun that's i love doing that that's fun and then anytime someone uh you know they're visiting and then the natives you know we're the natives show genuine interest where are you, where are you from what's your family like yeah when you, know, you actually recently, show that you know their opinion what their lifestyle is is it's important to learn about others and cultures right um, this guy recently had a guy in the, in our home from, uh, Nepal. He was from Kathmandu. 
or a, a little little town outside of Kathmandu. And we're like, oh, that's that's cool. What is it? What is it like? What's the weather like? And he started. You could just see in his eyes he was uh, excited just to talk about home. And at one point he pulled up his phone to to find a picture, and, and I saw a tear in his eyes, um, like he was uh, showing a piece of himself. Like this is where I'm from, and you you like that, you know what I mean? You appreciate that. And to me, I mean, I've I've cried when I showed someone a picture of Mississippi. I know exactly how that is. Like, and, uh, SSI, SSI, I love I love it there so much. <laughs> Break down in the full tears. Exactly. Um, but anyway, I think the main thing is just love. There's a lot of love on this road, mm-hmm. and um, you know, genuine do do anything for you. Uh, love you enough to tell you, hey, you, you need to quit messing with that. That's yeah. real love too, by the way. Being that's able not... to have the hard conversations. That's right. why that's... I, I said to you about the health and the mental health and being able to check you, be, yeah. be, having that kind of love and that openness and that willingness to say the hard things to one another, whether you like the outcome of it or not. Right. I mean, I think real love in dealing with, let's say, children you can't give a child everything that they want because it's not good for them. They can't no, eat all not, the candy they want. That's, that's not love. Oh, I love my child too much to deprive them. No, you're an idiot. You yeah, need to love them enough to that. say, no, yeah. no, you little moron. You're going to kill yourself. Get away from there. Yes. That's, that, that is much closer to real love, even though it's it seems in a different tone not. of voice. Yeah, it's not a, it wouldn't go on a Hallmark card, but that is real love. You know? Have you seen Hallmark cards lately? Not There's this some... season. Okay, well, I'm gonna send you some. I'm gonna send you some cards down. You're gonna have to hide them from your children. Really? There's Hallmark? some cards lately. There are well, maybe not Hallmark specifically, but there... I mean, I've seen a I've seen a raunchy card or two, but Hallmark <laughs> is always very is always very like pluck the old heartstrings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think they've. Uh, I, I pay attention to people's branding. I like their branding. You're also you. That's interesting because you really are like a full creative guy. You really do like doing the, you really like doing the actual work. But then you like the 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 stuff behind it, the behind the scenes, the packaging, the you know the media, the way that they're portraying their brand. That's interesting. You really truly are the artistic type, then, aren't you? Yeah, I'm always you know for watching TV or something. I'll listen to the commercials kind of critically. like oh that was a good commercial that made me want to buy that product or kind of like i don't know that that didn't really work that was i think they should have gone with a different voiceover or whatever i don't know do you think that um that helps you though in your profession i think so i think you need to have your finger on the pulse of the industry you're in to some degree you know it's funny that you say that because i i'm kind of at that crossroads where i i really don't want to be on social media But there's this necessary evil that I feel like I fight against all the time. And with that, I mean, you can compare yourself so much to so many other brands. You can look at all these other brands in my industry, being in the fashion industry now and me learning what it is, what that actually means as a brand head is um, slightly terrifying. Uh, I've been welcomed into the community, taking a little bit of time, but we've been welcomed in. But I will say, though, if you can spend all your time looking at other people's brandings, like days and days and hours and hours, and it's inc- it's like incredibly insane to me that people can sit there and stare at their phones the way that they do. And then I watch the social dilemma and I realize how much that is actively going on all over the place. Like, it's not just me. Like, this is like a problem. This is yeah. like a serious problem. <laughs> like, big yeah, time. it really is. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to, I just want to just talk a little bit more about really what you guys do as a family, being such a large family with large family, with uh, a lot of veterans and military history and things like that and living where you live. Um, maybe this is a misconception, but, uh, so forgive me if it, I'm completely ignorant here. I, I'm just trying to learn and I'm trying to understand. I always found a lot of times as, um, in the States, in the South at least, it was a very much like boys don't cry, hard, hardened, like suck it up kind of thing. And I was kind of raised a little bit like that to an extent. And I'm glad I was. Um, how do you find with 
your guys, like your your boys and your girls, the, your, your family that you have actually served with, I mean, that have actually served, if there's ever been a mental health thing, how do you guys cope with that? Is Do you keep it in-house as a family? Do you guys believe in things like, psycholo- like in psychology and, and, and those types of treatments? Well, the, um, to my knowledge, I, we've never had anyone with a severe crisis. So I will say that. That's incredible. So I, so I don't know how we okay. would uh, cope with that. I definitely think that, um, uh, you know, modern medicine and psychological treatments are, mm-hmm. I mean, definitely, we're definitely not like, uh, you know, hermits who think it's no of course no I, <laughs> yeah. well some people do so some I, people I, really I don't, <clears throat> aren't for it man yeah i think um i think um now obviously i'm not a, a trained uh doctor or anything but a lot of the times what a trained doctor is going to do is uh talk to you and ask questions from a place of genuine concern mm-hmm. well if you've got family members or friends that are doing that, you may not get to that point mm-hmm. that you, that you need to pay somebody to go ask you questions. Exactly. It's you know, that community. Yeah. So some people, they just don't, they don't have that. They either don't have friends or maybe they've without meaning to intentionally cut themselves off yeah. and they're, they're kind of, um, you know, in a hard place and maybe don't even realize it. And then, you know, they don't know where to go. And, um, but I think, a just being around people that love you, that genuinely care about you, yeah. is, that never hurt anybody. <laughs> you and, know what I mean? Regardless of whether I need like professional treatment or not, being around people that love you and they're going to look out for you and look for triggers that like, okay, hey, hey, just, hey. Sh- yeah, that's not like a thing. For, for let's them. not talk about this right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, th- that will, that's only going to be beneficial. That, and, and that sounds, honestly, the, the answer really there is community is what you said. It's having people who care. It's community. It's friends and family around you and not and not um, locking yourself in, you know, a, in a, into a room to allow your thoughts to eat away at you. And I, I love, like I said, how you how you guys think about that and how you view that and having, like I said, you're so fortunate to have the, the community and the tight knit, um, you know, family who have seen similar things to you, who have been a part of similar things to you they can actually get it like and maybe a normal civilian friend might not necessarily get and um i think that's beautiful so i i you know as far as as far as um you being on our podcast i'm incredibly grateful i uh met you very serendipitously via overline uh, online with um with tim and the veteran project and got introduced to your family and i've been nothing but fans of you guys ever since and um i'm incredibly thrilled that your mugs are available online your wife tagged me in something oh yeah that's right i forgot about that i was i didn't forget i'm so excited i like i'm gonna promote the hell out of your mugs and i'm gonna just i'm gonna <laughs> need to buy jake's mugs they're handmade they hold a great amount of coffee and they're made with love they better be made with love they're made with love every one of them oh okay see because now yeah. i'm not concerned I got concerned. Yeah, there. yeah. Like, questionable amount of love put into it, then I can't endorse okay. that. Okay, well, these aren't for you then, because there's love in these ones. Oh well, see, then I feel like you're gonna sell the hell out of them as long as there's love. I mean, I'm good. Nope, don't say that. Never mind. I am really grateful, uh, Jake. And I, I, is there anything I missed that you would love to talk about at all, work-wise, that we can promote for you? Not really. I'm, uh, I'm happy to just come on and and talk to you and and uh i love what you're doing i love what you do for the uh not only the veterans community but just you know decent people everywhere and i appreciate that i like being associated with you as your friend hey uh, we're friends do you guys hear that we're friends (laughs) so yeah you know you're always welcome down at the down at the compound and if your compadres ever would be willing to show their face they're welcome to Oh, trust, trust. I have already been talking to Tim about coming down the second my borders open because I want to come hang out and shoot guns. And then I want to scare the shit out of them. (laughs) Well, yeah, he's already doing an impression of like a weird Borat. (laughs) (laughs) Side note before we go. 
answer me truthfully. Have you seen the new Bora? I haven't. I haven't seen the old Bora. I I was yeah. in the army when it came out. Like I know, I think I know every line from it. Apparently, just because my guy, you know, <laughs> like I was in. Uh, at a time you just you're very aware of Borat but I just I've never sat down and watched the whole thing okay do yourself and your brain a favor for comedy level like this is for not a darkness we started with the darkness we're going to finish with the light and Sasha Baron Cohen because he's one of the greatest actors did you guys ever see he did one on Amazon they called the spy it's a true story oh you want to talk about range of acting oh my god it's it's a drama, but it's a true story. It's about a, uh, it's about the Syrian war way back when. Anyway, insane, insane, incredible acting. Then he comes out with this, and I almost is this peed. a drama like a serious. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's called the. Sp really? I think it's called the Spy. I will Google it and like text it to you, or one of these lovely gentlemen will get the hint and and Google it for me. And look at those fingers go. I got one on a keyboard and another one on a computer, and I'm really hoping some of you are getting the answer for me. Can you guys please tell me which one's called? Sasha Baron Cohen is just spy. this. Yeah, it's called The Spy, and I believe it's on Amazon Prime. Netflix as well. Netflix as well. Okay, so it's uh, hour-long episodes, and I think it's a mini series. It's a limited series, but it's a true story about uh, a he was just like a regular guy, and I want to say he was Israeli, and then Mossad came to him and was like, "We need you to." Go. and this was during the time of like the Syrian like really sketchy like the 70s and like before. yeah okay um and he plays this character and I've never seen him play a serious character and I I am not even I cried at the end of the series I was so emotionally attached to that character and to to what that story was about it 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 got me really bad like I couldn't stop watching it until I knew what was going to happen because it just felt so intense and in such a beautiful way um but yeah, uh, but if you need comedy, that new Borat will, don't, I don't even want to say watch it with your wife because I feel like I am a lot less wholesome than your wife is. She doesn't like dirty comedy. She oh, was, I she's know. made a full circle. Like she used to just, like all she listened to was Lil Wayne and things like that. Just. And she made a full circle. Me? Does she? I mean, what's a full? What's a full circle? She left Little Wayne. Well, oh, okay, half circle, half circle. Where did she go to? Um, I said full circle. You're exactly right. Little Wayne, all the way back around Little Wayne, not like yeah. That, I'm right? like, what happened? Like, what what like happened? What did Wayne do <laughs> that was so bad? I look at. I'm so angry about this. I'm chopping you. I'm knifing you. What did she go to? Well, I mean, now she listens to much milder type of you know chill music classical and ben rector and things like that there's nothing opposed wrong to with that ludicrous and lil wayne you know, nobody just... needs Ludic ludicrous is a goddamn legend I, I don't care what you say jake and lil wayne is a god well, i didn't say they weren't and... incredibly successful i'm just saying like for, oh i don't i'm not talking successful for, lyrically geniuses for sheer uh you might say profanity Oh, yeah. yeah. See, listen. Th th that's what I'm saying. Listen, profanity is what profanity is. It's part of the language. None of us, a lot of people don't like it, and I can respect why. There is a, a lady-likeness where you start dropping F-bombs every other word, and they're like, well, yeah, you're not really great for daytime television. But you can be if you just you just tone it you tone it down. Here's the problem. I, I don't know how to tone it down, and I feel like when I do come visit, I'm going to leave and your wife is going to go back to her Eminem, Lil Wayne, Rick Ross. I'm going to have her just bump in the bass and you're going to be like, that's it. Can't be friends with that Canadian again. Never coming back here. Never. My little back. peaceful. No, no. Oh, you know what? It's okay. I can get her under some hard stuff. We can start doing Metallica, head banging her and her, her bright, her bright, beautiful orange hair. She would, she would be a, uh, if she got in the headbang and that would be eye catching for sure. I think it'd be eye catching, but I also think you calmed her down and we need to turn her back up. I didn't calm anybody down. That, that, that woman's nuts. Somebody down. That woman is not nuts. That woman is a beautiful human who has no, she is. She is. humans out of her that made her nuts. That is different. She didn't make herself crazy. Well, not even that. She's she was crazy when I met her, but that's why that's what I liked about her. She was so much different than me. 
Oh, oh, so she's like a spitting op. Okay, I get it. Oh, now. We're very uh, uh, different, very different. But I think the one thing that you guys share that's the greatest is just the love for your family. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys can you guys can connect on that. We do connect. Yeah, we connect, we connect on that. And, you know, a few other minor things. Like. We we both like working out. We both okay. like uh, sports. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. What kind of sports you do down there? Just football. Oh, uh, I like any kind as far as watching. Yeah. Football or in person. I like watching baseball. I don't like watching on TV, but a baseball game is fun to go sit in the stands, have the popcorn, the hot dog. It's relaxing. I've never been. I, <clears throat> I like it in football games. People want to stand and yell the entire game. I don't want to do that. If I'm going to pay money and sit in a broiling sun, I want to be, I want to just chill. I want to sit. I want to and, and baseball and games it's more at my pace. Yeah. It's yeah. more uh socially acceptable to sit like a you know, and just if yeah. something really good happens, you might stand up and yay. But it's not like on your feet the entire game, just standing. Uh, I haven't been to either. I haven't not been to either. I've heard all about this American NFL thing that you guys got going. That's real gnarly. Um, but I prefer sports where we don't wear helmets, uh like rugby. And uh and uh, I like to kick people in the face. So Taekwondo generally rolls really well with that. Uh, we don't, yeah, football, my brother played a little. Um, then he couldn't get any more concussions because he would have went to all mushy on me. So we couldn't let him hit his head again. So <laughs> he was out of that real quick. <laughs> I like, he, yeah. I mean, I don't know the rules very well, but I like rugby is a very, very, uh, I like that. It's very yeah, warlike. An Indian stick ball. Ooh. That's terrifying. That stuff. Yeah, we, we're, uh, one of my best friends, Choctaw Indian, he's like, you you know, you got to come down and play with me, brother. I'm like, you're like no. a white guy out there. Every, everybody be taking it out on me. No way. I'll they come should be watch. taking it out on you with that accent and you walking into a bunch of Indian crowd. That would be offensive. Yeah, but probably so. I feel the pain. But I'm fast. I'm, I, I'm, he's always like, oh, you're you're fast, brother. You'll be you'll be fine. You'll be fine. I don't know. You'll be fine until you're not fine. And then but really they are, you. they are extremely rough. They, they don't are. Have, That's one of there's like no, the hardest. there's no pads and it's every bit as, uh, contact contacty as football or rugby. It's just not as, there's not as many, you know, full speed shots probably, but you know what I mean? Yeah. You can whack people with a stick. You got a couple of clubs with you and you, yeah, it's rough. It's like being it's like uh, it's like being downtown New York before you get mugged. You can see it coming. It's going to happen. Nothing I can do about it. Nothing I can do about it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. You're being real creepy. I got my team looking through the camera lens. I'm real creepy here. Listen, I'm going to I could do this for hours with you. My God. And I'm, I'm totally going to do it again. And um, I'm sorry if you say no, but I'm just going to tell you it's going to happen again uh, because I think. I think you are great for the world to know more about, especially the way you view um, how you guys deal with, you know, your mental health and the importance of community, the values you have as a family, but also the positivity that you and your family. And I, I keep bringing up your family because I think you're just such an integral part of that as an example for your family and being able to move forward in things and really take initiative and drive and, and show everyone else, you know, from the tiny little humans you've got to the the giant other brothers that you've got that, you know, you can uh, really put yourself forward and it doesn't have to be a traditional way. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, you can do something in the arts and you can be successful at it. And it's just nothing, you know, it's been nothing but like a pleasure to have you as a friend and, and, and start to become, you know, in the little inner circle of all these Southern, these Southerners, I've never felt more welcome and um, more supported and knowing that, at any time, I bet you I could pick up the phone and call any single one of you and you would answer. And that, to me, is what it's all about and why I wanted to have you on. It's to show people that there's people like you out there that are really doing it and making the difference. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart and um, from everyone else listening. If there's anything that you do not understand in this podcast... <laughs> Well, then I will tell you what. You're going to have to go to Jake's site, learn a little bit more about him, and um, understand why he is as cool as he is. And uh, we'll be posting plenty about you as well and your incredible mugs because I have never found a mug I don't appreciate. And I don't know that, uh, I don't know that the, this world is ready for those mugs. 
<laughs> I appreciate I that. I'm so excited for the mugs. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. So just hang on here for a second. And everybody, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Brass and Unity podcast uh, with Jake Phillips. And uh, please check in next week. We'll have something new and fresh for you. See you later. Bye.